This is the first time I've done PowerPoint in about six years, and I'm not ashamed to say why. Um, Microsoft or whoever is in charge of PowerPoint charges a fee, a monthly or yearly fee, and I was just too cheap to pay for it. So <laughs> needless to say, I, I borrowed the laptop from the from, uh, from Mark Goad, and, and uh, thankfully he was able to help me, he and Devin, uh, put this PowerPoint together and uh, get caught up with technology. Um, I've learned uh, over the years, as, as I've become a father and, and just over time, that people learn in, in two different ways. Some people learn auditorily, just by hearing, and others learn through pictures and the pictures give meaning to the words that are spoken. That's the reason that I endeavored upon putting the PowerPoint together. This morning, we're going to be looking at the 143rd Psalm. Now, I'm going to be looking at other verses, but for time's sake, I've got those verses pre-typed for myself to read so that you won't have to try and turn to it. I know the most difficult thing for me as, a, as I try to take notes as I'm listening to a sermon is turn into the verses and by the time I get there, the preacher's already read the verse and we're moving on to another one. So that being said, I'm not going to do that. Now, if you're wondering about the change in the order of services, I will tell you, everyone, was, uh, everyone that I asked, uh, the elders I asked and everyone that I asked that's involved in the worship, uh, to, and we asked to change from partaking of the Lord's Supper before the, ser the sermon and to do it afterwards was, was very willing and very uh, easy to deal with. I had one person, my biggest critic, who was uh, not so much, uh, she wasn't upset about it, but she let me know. Uh, she said, my wife, she said, let me tell you something. If you're changing all this up, this better have something to do. This sermon better have something to do with the Lord's Supper and with Jesus. And I can, can safely say, yes, it does and, and it will, or at least I hope, I hope that's what you'll be able to take from it. So I want to start off this morning with asking you a question. How did you get here? As I studied the 143rd Psalm, 143rd Psalm written by King David, I started to take inventory of my life. I don't mean how did you get here physically. I've got some family in town visiting. And I know they came from far distances to be here. Uh, not so much to be here for the sermon as much to get into town. And I'm appreciative of that. But how did I get here? 26 years ago, or at least I think 26 years ago, it's, it's often t difficult to remember, I gave my life to the Lord in baptism. And I look back, as young as I was, and I look now to where I'm at now in life, I look, at, I look at that time and I see the domino effect. I see and, and I hope you can consider your own life and ask yourself, how did I end up here? I looked at it, unfortunately, with regret. I'm a glass half empty type of person. Hopefully, uh, we all can look at it with, a, with, with joy. But as I studied this psalm and as I took inventory of my own life in the past 26 years, I looked at it with regret. The other day, Adriana looked at me like I was crazy. I asked her, I said, uh, you, think, you think we could still have another child? As I inch closer to the age 40, I asked her that, and she, she looked at me like I was crazy, and, and, and I finally got around to telling her why I asked her that. As I've been looking at this domino effect and relationships and, and things that I've done that I'm not proud of, things that I've done that were selfish and self-centered for most of my life, I look at the dominoes and the effects that they've had on the people around me. And it is a sobering, sobering thought. It is a weight that no one wants to bear, no one wants to think about. But I look at it and I consider the time in my youth when my children were at their youngest as babies, as, as she struggled to take care of them and work a job and I was off at the gym or here or there, running around doing what I wanted to do. And as I've gotten older, I know to some of you you laugh, I know I'm young still, but 
as I've gotten older and I inch closer to 40, half my life is gone, I think about what could have been. What's going to happen to my children? The influence that I was on them at a young age. The influence that I'm having on them now. The influence that I had on my nieces and my nephews, my sisters, my cousins, my mother and my father, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you this morning, as we delve into this study, to take inventory, to consider the domino effect. You look up, and one thing's led to another. And another, and the choices you make, they have consequences. Some good, some bad. That being said, I think David... When he wrote this psalm, he was taking inventory. I think he was taking inventory on his life and considering not his physical situation. You know, David was a mighty man. He was a great, great king of God's people. A man whom God called a man after God's own heart. But... I think he's taken inventory and comes to a realization that before God, his eternal, not physical, but his eternal resting place was going to be in judgment. And he's begging God for mercy. He doesn't want to go before the judgment seat or the judgment throne of God, but he wants to go before the mercy seat of God. And I think all of us All of our hopes and prayers are that when this life is done, that's where we find ourselves. Mercy and grace and not judgment. Because we know that the justice and our unrighteousness and our sin leaves us short, leaves us in need. David, at that time in his life, before a Savior had come, before the covenant promise that David's throne would be established forever. David was looking and he realized, wait a minute, I'm a king physically, but what's going to happen to me eternally? And the problem we all have is sin that separates us eternally from a righteous God. So what's the solution? No man has defeated the grave. What else but judgment? Is there to be? And David, here he begs God in this penitential psalm. He begs God for help. And as we take inventory of our situation, so should we. The one thing that we can't get back is time. Money, you can lose it, you can get it back. Time, relationships, And the time you do or don't spend with your loved ones, the time you do or don't spend with God, the time you do or don't spend serving God, can't get that back. And raise your hand if you know who this is. In Greek mythology. So a small amount. Okay. So this will be good. So so my sermon is not about Greek mythology, but I want to use some Greek mythology to hopefully bring us to a thought. So this is hopeless Sisyphus. Sisyphus in Greek mythology was known for having tried to cheat death and the grave. And as he tried to or attempted to cheat death and the grave, his punishment for eternity was this right here. To do a menial task that didn't have any long-lasting effect for eternity. Pushing a rock up a, up a hill. And each day as he would try an effort and, and work to push that rock up that hill, it would fall back down and he would do it over again. And the Greeks, in their mythology, they were on to something. In our life, have you ever felt like you wake up and it's do it all over again? The same thing over and over and over. Have you ever felt hopeless 
Like, okay, I go to work. I watch my children get older. Life passes me by. I get aches and pains. Things happen. People die. People I love die. And it started over again. Well, Sisyphus was hopeless. And I'd like to read a quote. I can't remember where I found it. But it goes something like this. So picture two mountains in a valley. And Adriana and I, although both grew up here in southeast Texas and lived below sea level, we had the good fortune to move to southern New Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico, when we first were married. And we lived in the Mesilla Valley. And we had what I thought at the time, although carrying groceries up three flights of stairs to our apartment was a chore, we had what I thought was the best view because we were at the edge of town and we had the Oregon Mountains to about 30 miles in the distance and no lights and no city in between. So we lived in a valley. <clears throat> but this, this saying or this phrase, we exist in the valley of time between the birth mountain and the death mountain. It goes something like this in my mind. God is in eternity. Yes, eternity exists outside the bounds of time. Scientists and, and men of great knowledge have, have efforted for decades, centuries, thousands of years possibly, to, to figure out time and understand time and space. But God is in eternity, up above this, this great mountain. And these two great mountains, when we're born, we descend into the valley of life, into the bounds of time. We can't escape time. <clears throat> it passes. And as we know, we see time when we look at ourselves in the mirror. As my children grow older, I see time has passed by. As I look at myself in the mirror and see my hair start to fall out and my children make fun of me, I know that time has passed by. And as we live in this valley of time, we're slowly but surely, like Sisyphus, marching to, well, working to, walking to our death. And it's a climb. You young people may not have experienced it yet, but I feel like I can be with the older crowd now and say, the pains and the aches, the heartache and the tears, the, the worry for your loved ones, it's a climb. And then there's death. I'd like to read Job chapter 14. And we're all familiar with Job. You don't have to turn there. But in Job, Job had a, a pretty rough hand dealt to him after serving God loyally and faithfully. And in Job, the 14th chapter, he says, Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Like a flower, he comes forth and withers. He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. You also open your eyes, speaking of God, on him and bring him into judgment with yourself. Who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and his limits you have made so that he cannot pass. Turn your gaze from him that he may rest until he fulfills his day like a hired man. For there is hope for a tree when it is cut down that it will sprout again. And its shoots will not cease. Though its roots grow old in the ground and its stump dies in dry soil, at the scent of water it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. But man dies and lies prostrate. Man expires. And where is he? As water evaporates from the sea and a river becomes patched and dried up, so man lies down and does not rise. Until the heavens are no longer, they will not awake 
nor be aroused out of their sleep. There's hope for a tree, but for man, in this valley of time, there is no hope physically. We cannot escape it. As much as we try to stay healthy, to eat healthy, to take care of ourselves, death is coming for all of us. It's going to get us. God said it that way. The church at Laodicea in Revelations as John being given the word from Jesus in Revelations, the third chapter, the church at Laodicea is one of my favorite, uh, I guess, judgments of the seven churches. There in Revelations, the third chapter, in verses 14 through 22, he says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love. I correct and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who, over, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now that was written to a church, the church at Laodicea, but I believe that was written to individuals and can be written to us and said of us as individuals as well as a church. The physical, we have need for nothing. The least of us has need for nothing. Physically. Spiritually, do we recognize our hopelessness, our helplessness, our nakedness before God? As the Apostle Paul wrote to believers in the region of Philippi, to the Philippian Christians, in Philippians, the third chapter, in verse 18, he said, For many walk, of whom I've often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. That may go against some theology, but these are the words written through an apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit. This comes from God. These were Christians who left and now are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to himself. Now, I don't read that verse to put shame on anyone. I read that verse because in my personal reflection, I recognized that could be said of me in life. In these 26 years since I committed myself and gave my life to the Lord, that could be said of me at times. Here, King David is sitting on the throne 
he's being anointed in the picture here. I say anointed. He's been anointed. I guess you'd say he's being crowned finally. After a very, very long time, David had spent... I didn't realize this as I studied this, but I was trying to pinpoint when in David's life he wrote this psalm. And I believe he wrote this psalm. As you can see from the chart, hopefully you can make it out. If not, I'll try to do my best to summarize. But I believe David wrote this psalm not, not whenever he was on the run from Saul trying to kill him out of jealousy, not after his sin and murder and adultery, murder of Uriah and sin of adultery with Bathsheba. I believe this, this psalm was written at the time when he finally was the king of united 12 tribes of Israel at his mountaintop. I want you to think, at your time in life, can you think back to a time when you were on the mountaintop, when you had some success? Maybe you're there now. Maybe, maybe it was in the past. Maybe your success is to come. But think back to a time when you were on the mountaintop. And I think David wrote this at that time. See, King David, he was the youngest of Jesse's sons. He was the eighth son. And as the first king of Israel, Saul, became evil and became bitter, and God sent an evil spirit upon him, Samuel, the prophet, was sent to Jesse's house. God had sent him there and didn't tell him who he was going to anoint. But one of Jesse's sons was going to be anointed to be the future king of Israel. The future king of God, the Creator's people. So David, as a young boy, is out tending the sheep, a shepherd, the shepherd boy, and he is called in. Because after going through all the sons, finally, God reveals to Samuel that it's going to be David. And I didn't realize that David was anointed king, anointed to be king at a very young age. It was some almost 33 years, some say 37 years, from the time when Samuel anointed him as a boy until he was truly crowned and ruled over all 12 of the tribes. He ruled at Hebron after Saul's death for about seven and a half years just over Judah. And then finally, finally it all came to, to fruition. The promise that had been promised to him before as he was a young boy, now God had grown him up and now he is crowned to rule over God's people. And that's not something that David took lightly. You've got to remember, David started as a shepherd boy. He's anointed to be king, but all that brought was jealousy from his brothers, from his family. As a matter of fact, uh, he goes, I didn't realize that as he goes to the battle, the great battle of the Philistines, the great giant Goliath, is standing out as it was customary in their day of battle. Instead of all of them going to war and killing each other, they would take one warrior and say, okay, let's take your best warrior and we'll take our best warrior and we'll decide who's the victor based on whoever wins that one, that one fight. David had already been anointed, but he shows up. He shows up to the battle, this young boy who couldn't even fit into any armor, battle armor. He was so little. And he sees... His brothers, as he's there to deliver food to them, and he sees his brothers cowering. They're cowering. Saul is cowering. At this point, Saul is, he's begging. He says, whoever will, will, will take and go and defeat this giant, I'll give, I'll give my, my, my first, my daughter, I'll give you her hand in marriage. I'll give you great wealth. He couldn't pay anyone to do it. No one wanted to do it. And David's attitude? <laughs> David shows up just to deliver food to his brothers and his attitude is who is this filthy Gentile? Who is this that curses and mocks God the creator? Who is he? Yeah, he's nine foot tall. Who is he? He didn't want for Saul's daughter to be his wife. He didn't want for any of that. He wanted 
victory for God. He wanted the righteousness of God to be reflected through him in defeating Goliath that was made true. This is the David that was on the run from Saul after Saul was given an evil spirit and Saul was only calmed by the playing of the harp. Guess who happened to be the player of the harp that was brought in to calm that evil spirit as King Saul still ruled in his final days? David. David played the harp. And you know, Saul grew jealous of David. So jealous that people would sing. Jealous? David wasn't trying to get glory. He wasn't about himself like we can sometimes be. Whereas Saul, Saul was about himself. Saul throws a spear at him in anger, in jealousy. David didn't do anything. Then he sends David on the run and puts out a hit on his life. David has to live with the regret of going to the priest in need of food. He takes the showbread and eats it. And then he takes Goliath's sword to protect himself as he flees his own homeland. This is after being told by Samuel he's going to be king. And all this is happening to him. And, and yet, Dagon, this evil man, Saul, pays, goes in and kills every one of the Lord's priests. All the Levitical priests. David regretted that. David felt it was on him that it happened. And of course, later in David's life, he finally, although I think in regret, his best friend Jonathan, Saul's son, dies with Saul in battle. So as David is ascending to the throne, I don't think it's a, yay, I'm on the mountaintop of life. He's lost his best friend. He's lost time and relationships with loved ones that he can never get back. Jonathan is dead. He loved like a brother. King Saul is now dead. And it finally, finally comes to fruition that he is on the throne. This is the mindset I believe David was coming from as he penned the 143rd Psalm. Turn with me to the 143rd Psalm if you haven't. So here, David is pleading to God. As we'll read in this psalm, David sees himself a humble servant. Yes, he's a king. Yes, he's ascended to the greatest height of the greatest military, military power known to exist in the day. Of the greatest God, the only true and living God, king over his people. That's, that's a temptation, I believe, for pride to come in. Most of us, I believe, if we were given the, the seat of ruler over all the land, over everyone in the world, or everyone in the, this country, we would be tempted to be selfish and proud and arrogant. I mean, it's very easy in our flesh, right? But David, as he writes this penitential psalm, he's humbled. Humbled for the position that God has allowed him to be in. And humbled for the position his soul finds itself in. The same position our souls, our spirits find themselves in. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. And do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no man living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places, like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. 
My heart is desolate within me. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I muse on the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you as a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will become like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I take refuge in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble, and in your loving kindness, cut off my enemies. And destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. Here in verses 1 and 2 is David's plea. David's plea is one that is desperate. He says in in verse 1, Give ear to my supplications. David humbles himself before God, just as we should. Answer me in your faithfulness and in your righteousness. David knows that God's not going to hear him nor answer him in in David's faithfulness or David's righteousness because he has none in front of God. He realizes what we all should realize when we take inventory. If it weren't for the faithfulness and the righteousness, the loving kindness of God, we would be hopeless like the Greek mythology of Sisyphus. Hopeless for eternity. When we have want for nothing, it can be difficult to put God in His proper place and see just how much we need Him. In Romans, the third chapter, the Apostle Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah in verse 10 through 18, as it is written, There is none righteous, not even one, There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In our flesh, that can be described of every last one of us. An asp is a snake, a very venomous snake of their area. So as we consider the words of Isaiah that the Apostle Paul quotes to the church at Rome in chapter 3 here, there's none righteous, not even one. No one, not a one of us, can claim that we're perfect. Every one of us is imperfect, and that's okay. We shouldn't be content with it, but we better come to realize it. No one is righteous before a righteous God. And here David, David cries out for an answer to his prayer. He needs an answer. And he knows the only way that God will even give ear to him is in God's righteousness and God's faithfulness. Later in chapter 3 and verse 23 of Romans, we're familiar with the often quoted, all for all have sinned and fall short or come short of the glory of God. Proper alignment, like David has here in verses 1 and 2, is necessary. It must be 
maintained to have relationship with the righteous God. Only submitted can we heed the words of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the 16th verse. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence, as David is doing, to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. David goes on to say in verse 2 of the 143rd Psalm, Do not enter into judgment with your servant. He's the king. And he, he's saying, I'm but your servant. Please, God, do not enter into judgment. For in your sight, no man living is righteous. David got it. David understood his spiritual situation. So what's the problem? He speaks here in verses 3 and 4 of the enemy. The enemy has persecuted my soul. And some, some people want to take and say the enemy is Saul. Some people want to take and say the enemy was his son Absalom when he overthrew the throne. I, just knowing David, I don't believe that's the case. The enemy is the same enemy that we have. The enemy... The problem or the nature of David's crisis, the enemy that is persecuting his soul, is sin and death. Sin and death. He says in verse 3, the enemy has persecuted my soul. Verse 4, my spirit is overwhelmed. It faints within me. My heart is desolate within me. David recognized the problem, his sin, and earnestly prays for the pardon of his sin. Man was created with free will. We have the ability to choose. And with the ability to choose, we can obey or disobey the commands of God. In Genesis, the second chapter... We're introduced to this thought in the garden. In verse 16, we learn of the accuser, Satan. In verse 16 of Genesis 2, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Adam and Eve didn't die physically. But when Satan tempted Eve, she ate of it, the fruit of that tree, and Adam followed suit, they no longer were allowed to be in the presence of God. They were booted or kicked out of the garden. There were curses placed on them that we still have to this day. The enemy, the accuser of the brethren, we might say. And let's not play victim. Because what, Satan didn't force anyone to eat of that fruit. They made a choice. They had free will. And thank God for free will. But in that choice, sin came into the world. And sin has poisoned this world that we live in. And we can see the consequences of sin all around us, whether it be in our life, the lives of those we love, or just the world in which we live in that's full of selfishness, hate, strife, envy, and deceit. We learn of the accuser Satan in Job. Job had done nothing wrong. Job was a godly man, a God-fearing man. In Job, the first chapter, in verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now hold up. How's that work? How'd Satan get to go before God? Well, that's another question to be answered for another day. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? 
Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? Job was enjoying the blessings of a fruitful life. He had many children, a loving wife, wealthy and livestock and everything around him. He was the, the wealthiest man of all that lived in the town around him. Satan says, have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord and went on, as we know, Job, the only thing Satan couldn't do to Job was kill him. But he sure could kill his children. Immediately, his children, his loved ones, wiped out. Immediately, his health wiped out. Immediately, his wealth wiped out. What's Job going to do? What do we do? Where do we turn? David recognized where to turn. The enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have long been dead. David realized that this enemy is real. Satan is real. First Peter, Peter talks about Satan. And he tells us to be of sober spirit in chapter 5 and verse 8. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The world will tell us Satan's a myth, God's a myth, all this is just a myth. No, it's real. He's real. He's our enemy. And sin and death and eternal separation from God is what he brings and has brought to this world. King David recognized and realized the spiritual war that was and is being waged for man's soul, the consequences of which are physical and yet have eternal implications. I, I, I wanted to put this picture up and I want you to consider, although I couldn't find the right picture, I want you to consider, you wake up, you find yourself in the middle of the ocean with no land in sight. You're treading water and you're holding on to a piece of a wrecked ship. You don't know when any rescue is coming. You have no hope. The sun is beating down on you. Waves and the water are crashing around you. That is man's spiritual situation. We need to wake up. We need to wake up out of our slumber. There is a war being waged spiritually and Satan wants every one of your souls. He wants your soul. He wants your children's soul. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. If someone came to our house with a gun, would we let them in? And they meant to do us harm? No. But how often do we let Satan into our lives? How often do we play around with our spiritual situation? How often do we play Russian roulette with our children's lives by what we put in front of them? By our lack 
of consideration for God's Word, our lack of growth. They're watching. Here as a spiritual church family, every one of us are related. We are all brethren in Christ. So what are we doing to watch out for one another? The enemy is real. David recognizes that eternally he's got a problem. He needs help. So here, without God, we're hopeless. So what's your situation? We must first get properly aligned. We must submit my will. I must submit my will to God's will. I must obey Him. I must recognize that I have sin and repent of it. God has provided a way. It's what we all call the gospel, the good news. Although man is and we are undeserving, God has made a way, or better put, brought about a solution to our problem. David, in verses 5 and 6, says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I consider the work of your hands. Here, we have the rainbow. This is a promise that God made to Noah after the flood that he would never destroy the earth again by flood. He said, I'm going to put my bow in the cloud and you will know that I will never destroy the earth by waters of flood again. David knows where to go to gain strength. Not in himself. He remembers the days of old. Secondary lesson. Guard your innocence, young ones. Protect your innocence. You cannot get it back. Primary, primarily, we should learn and recognize from David, we don't go to ourselves for strength. We go to God's Word and we go to the things that God has done in the past, the promises that He made to Father Abraham that He followed through on, the promises that He made all throughout the Old Testament, the promise of the rainbow, after the flood, that we can still see to this day. I'll never forget, Adriana was about to give birth to Elizabeth. We were in New Mexico in the hospital, and out there it was a very dry desert climate, so we didn't get very much rain, and when it rained, just a little bit, it flooded, not like here. And I look out the window, and it, it, it's so, it was so amazing to see, but just before, as I was scared and afraid, because she was, she was breech, they tried to turn Elizabeth in her, in her stomach, and they couldn't. I was scared. The anesthesiologist kept putting this medicine that I was afraid was going to get to Elizabeth in Adriana's IV, and they were trying to turn her so they could have the pregnancy natural. And as they took her away to, to get her prepped for a C-section, I looked out the window, and there was a rainbow. And it, it brought to me in remembrance at a time when I was scared, didn't know what to expect, but looking back on it, it brought me comfort. It brought me joy. And, and that's something that David is doing here as he's remembering and meditating on all of God's doings. The rainbow and the cloud. So where does David draw his strength? He meditates on all of God's great works. He desires to know the Father more closely. He considers all the amazing things God has done, and we should too. He carefully thought of all the great works God had done. The ache in David's soul did not drive him away from God, and the ache in our soul should not drive us to worldly things. It should drive us closer to God, to draw near to God. It drove David to prayer, to praise, and deep longing. That is where we are to look for strength. In Proverbs, the 8th chapter, and 17th verse, I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek me will find me. In verse 7 of the 143rd Psalm, David says, Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me. Time is running out. 
God, I need an answer. I need to know why is this happening. Just as Job sat as his wife told him to curse God and die as he was aching and his body was hurting from all the boils that were, that were all over his body. He needed an answer and he needed it quickly. And he turns to God for strength. Where do we look for strength? Matthew 6 and 24, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. God the Son says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. We have to make a choice. Not just once, daily. We have to choose who we're going to put our strength in. Am I going to put my strength and my trust in myself, in this world, in my job, in someone, someone else? Or am I going to put my strength and trust in God and His Son who it pleased, as we read in the Scripture reading, as Isaiah prophesied, who it pleased God to crush Him on the cross so that He might deliver us, worthless us, so that He might deliver man from sin and death. It pleased God to crush His Son. I cannot understand that, that kind of love. In Matthew 6 and 33, Jesus says, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 8 of the 143rd Psalm, David realizes without a Savior, he would be eternally away from the presence of God. He says, cause me to hear or teach me the way. Teach me to do your will in verse 10. David cries out this, teach me. He wants to be taught. This is the king. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke of sin and death, the yoke of the Greek mythology of Sisyphus, the yoke of our guilt and our sin that we have, if, if of our own strength we try to carry, it will kill us. Physically, it will put us in an early grave. It will bring weakness to our bones. Jesus says, I've paid the price. I've done it for you. I love you. Take my yoke upon you. And a yoke in their day was a farming tool. They would hook an ox to a yoke and that ox would take the yoke and they would plow the field. Jesus is saying, the yoke of sin and the guilt of sin and looking back on regrets and the hopelessness you don't have to have that. Choose me, he says. Selfless love. Jesus came to show. In John, the 14th chapter, in the 6th verse, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Here we have a picture of not only the empty tomb where Jesus was raised, but in the distance, Golgotha, the place where Mary, Jesus' mother, and John, Jesus' disciple, stood and watched as a beaten, bruised Son of God hung upon a tree, crucified, so that He could deliver us. Who are we to not but fall on our knees in humility and gratitude for His mercy and His grace? The desire to know the Father 
Jesus left the glory of heaven to do the Father's will, to be the perfect, sinless sacrifice, to fulfill the the law, so that by His stripes we are healed. Now we live with a purpose. This life here on earth, in this valley of time, doesn't have to be purposelessness. It doesn't have to be hopelessness. It doesn't have to be full of grief and sorrow. Yes, we will have heartache and pain, but we have a hope through Jesus, through His sacrifice. We have an example of how to live, and we have the hope of eternal life. Now, we live with purpose so that the righteousness of God may be seen in our lives to a lost and hopeless world. So, to make sure that I get this right before the Lord's Supper, in what way does the 143rd Psalm point to Jesus? I believe there's three ways. In a way greater than David, Jesus Christ, the Son of David, knew grief. David spoke of here in verse 4. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is distressed. Jesus, just before His betrayal and crucifixion, prayed to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew, the 26th chapter and the 38th verse. As he's sweating drops of blood, he said, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And he asked his disciples to remain here and keep watch with me. Jesus asked the Father, If it be thy will, thy will be done. But if this cup could pass from me, let this cup pass from me. This cup that he was to drink was the cross. And he and his flesh, sweating drops of blood, did not want to endure the pain that he was going to go through, that crushing that must be done. But he did endure it. In a second way, Jesus longed for his God and his Father with great thirst. In verse 6 of the 143rd Psalm, Psalm, For my soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Jesus experienced both that soul thirst, having left the glories of heaven to come live on earth as a man, and literally thirst, especially on the cross. He thirsted after the completion of the Father's will, the salvation of man. And thirdly, the third way that the 143rd Psalm points to Jesus, according to the righteousness of God, the soul of Jesus was delivered out of trouble. In verse 11, of the 143rd Psalm, for your righteousness sake bring my soul out of trouble. Jesus, according to the righteousness of God, had his soul brought out of trouble of death and the grave. He did not see decay or corruption in the grave, but raised on the third day, defeating not only sin, but also death once and for all. And my favorite verse to close with, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the Apostle Paul wrote in the 50th verse, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, 
Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Come now as we stand and as we sing.